All right, so I'm gonna have to make an exception here and preface this video with a little bit of a disclaimer in the start. So ever since I started working on this video, starting sort of on the 21st, 22nd of April, the German government aligned me regarding heavy weapon exports has not just made 180, it's made like a 360, then like a 540, and things are changing all the time, and the news we're getting is just conflicting all the time. So what I will say is this, now with the recent news, for example, coming out today on the 26th, of April, it looks like certain weapon systems like Gepard might in fact be sent to Ukraine. This is not yet just confirmed, so we'll have to see. So whatever I say in the video right now that is following, just take that as a sort of indication of how things certainly used to be and the sort of debate that was happening in Germany. But of course, things we are in an evolving situation, so things can of course change. So with that disclaimer done, hope you enjoyed the video. Hey, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and it's once again time to talk about German heavy weapon deliveries to Ukraine. Are they happening? Are they not happening? What is the holdup? What is the policy situation there? What is the stance of the German government? Now, ever since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia on the 24th of February 2022, I've been making videos about the situation until sort of mid-March mid because at that point there was actually not relatively little things to say about well, military aviation as well as German foreign policy and security policy and so on and so forth, which is sort of the areas that I look at, right? Of course, there have been things happening on the ground in Ukraine, there have been political shifts as well, but if you zoom out from sort of the areas that I look at, there was relatively few things that could be said in concrete terms. However, ever since then, I've also noticed that there has been quite an influx on YouTube on videos about Germany and German deliveries and not all of them get the facts quite right, I would say, perhaps because also there's a language barrier with being unable to actually understand and read German and getting the news sources maybe from uh, from other outlets. So I thought, you know what, let's talk about German heavy weapon deliveries to Ukraine, what is happening, and specifically also look at systems like Gepard. So let's get going. In the last weeks, many people have been asking whether NATO countries are going to be supplying heavy weapons to Ukraine. And one of the main countries in this discussion has, of course, been Germany, with martyrs or leopards or gepards and even Panzerhaubitzen being at the sort of uh, core of this discussion. And there have been conflicting reports in the media, as well as sort of in the different language spaces. Actually, I've seen very different articles being written in German to, for example, the ones that make it into the Anglosphere. Uh, about what Germany actually has, what the stockpiles are, uh, what stuff is operationally uh, ready to be used and what stuff has to go for a refitting purpose and so on and so forth and what has already been uh, sent to the junkyards and um, cut into pieces. So Germany essentially gives three main reasons as to why they have yet to send heavy weapons to Ukraine. Now the first reason here, the first argument is of course, the limited German stockpile of what the Bundeswehr actually has, especially also has in usable condition, because of course, the inventory and what is operational ready, those are two different numbers. So, for example, there is this often circulated picture that uh, came out on, on Twitter, I believe somewhere mid-March, that shows a whole bunch of martyrs just standing around there. Well, that picture is actually from 2014 and shows a junkyard where these martyrs have been sent to to be dismantled. So that's a little bit outdated, but that of course doesn't mean that Germany doesn't have martyrs that are not in an operational condition. In a recent report, for example, by the Bundeswehr, martyrs are said to have stood roughly around 68% of operational readiness. Now, Germany also has now seemingly uh, vowed to, or announced rather, to send martyrs to Slovenia so that then Slovenia can send T60, T72 tanks to Ukraine. And this seems to be sort of these, uh, this rolling substitution that NATO countries have, uh, have now decided on in order to allow Ukraine to get equipment that they can already use because T72s are used by the Ukrainian army of course and that the countries that send these weapons are then getting substitute from other NATO countries like Germany, like the US and so on and so forth. But for the Gepards now specifically, since I've been talking about martyrs, for the Gepards, the situation is a slightly different because the German army has not used them since 2012. 
and most of them if have either been sent through the junkyards to for dismantling or there has in fact been uh, some of them that have been put into storage and there is also again once again one uh, image that has uh, circulated on twitter on this showing quite a few gephards being in storage seemingly in storage i can't show it here due to imaging rights but just remember I have it linked in the description and that image is actually from 2019 so it is once again outdated. That said, apparently around 50 Gepards were stored by Kraus Maffei Wegmann, a company that helped produce them. Only one day after the invasion, this company proposed sending these to Ukraine after refurbishment. German defense company Kraus Maffei Wegmann could supply anti-aircraft gun tanks from its own inventory to Ukraine. The decision is up to the German government, says KMW CEO Ralf Ketzel in an interview with Welt. We have around 50 Gepard type models in our inventory that could be made operational again relatively quickly. Of course, this is not the last offer that the German industry has made towards Ukraine, but so far the German government has blocked most of these measures. That being said, I tried to find out how much the Gepard refurbishment would cost and what the time schedules would be. And I don't mean just also training the uh, people that would be using them, but specifically just refurbishing the machines. But I didn't really find any definite data. All I can say is taking the word of the manufacturer might not be the smartest course of action, especially if they're so vague as to say relatively quickly. Uh, but uh, yeah, so far I don't have any data uh, from what I can see or uh, that gives us a sort of a conclusive estimate. The second argument of why Germany is not sending heavy weapons to Ukraine at the moment is because it says that it has to retain these to fulfill NATO obligations as well as keep the Bundeswehr in a uh, condition to fight. Now, this has of course drawn criticism for very selfish behavior that Germany doesn't really want to help Ukraine, but Poland has recently well, there has been sort of this announcement that Poland might have sent 100 T-72 tanks. I don't think there has been an official confirmation just yet. If somebody has maybe in Poland an official confirmation, I'll link to that. Please send it to me. Um, but uh, that also, that announcement comes after Poland has agreed with the US of receiving 250 Abrams tanks in order to you know, fill that void, I guess, that uh, sending tanks to Ukraine would leave. Likewise, it looks like Slovenia is going to be sending T-72 tanks to Ukraine. And this is also once again in that rolling substitution with Germany by receiving martyrs. Countries like Poland, Estonia and the Czech Republic have made sizable contributions to Ukraine. Between end of February to end of March, Germany's overall help was mainly on humanitarian support, but very low in terms of military support proportional to GDP. Even if Germany tries to take some credit for support, like with the Czech export of ex-German IFVs, with Germany we have a country that in the perception of many people has made some poor choices in the past and does not do enough now. So from that perspective, it is not surprising that its behavior is getting scrutinized more aggressively. And then the third and final main argument that we hear from Germany is of course that, well, if you send heavy weapons, these require extensive and time-intensive training sessions. And this is not the same as sending stingers or panzerfausts or, you know, ex-Soviet equipment that the Ukrainians can use immediately, just hop in and drive off, right? And this is really one of the main concerns. As uh, Chancellor, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has recently said in his newest uh, press conference on the 19th of April uh, 2022. In addition, we are ready to support our NATO partners who still have weapon systems that originate from Russian production, are used in Ukraine itself, and are ready for immediate deployment. Of course, there are also weapon systems that our partners supply, such as artillery, which require that there be close cooperation among the Allies. Whether it's decisions that the US or the Netherlands make, close cooperation on these issues is important to us. Now at this point he also seems to refer to that Dutch initiative, isn't he, uh, to supply Ukraine with uh, German Panzerhaubitze 2000. Uh, I mean he doesn't mention the Haubitze explicitly, but you know it does sound like that from the announcement. And of course Germany has also said that it is most likely going to be supporting this initiative by providing uh, training to Ukrainian soldiers on the Panzerhaubitze 2000. Now, 
The issue of proper training, however, really is a sticking point in Germany and in the German discussion. For example, and I mind you, this is also amongst those people that really want to help Ukraine. There has been a very interesting uh, conversation recently between the uh, chair of the defense committee of the German parliament, which is uh, Marie Agnes Strack Zimmermann, and she was in conversation with the Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, Andrei Melnik, and she in that discussion said this. Yes, we should send heavy weapons, but we always talked about armed vehicles. You talked about martyr. These are systems that, and this has to be said very clearly, these are systems that are complex. You can do that, but that person drives three meters and then if he meets the Russians, frankly, he will no longer be capable of winning. The martyr there are, up front, three people, the commander, the gunner, the driver. In the rear, six people. These are trained in Germany. This training can be compressed. They drive in a platoon of two to four. These need to communicate. This is not a, just a case of we jump on board and drive off. Yes, of course, these are systems we do not have, but these are not spaceships where you train for a year to be able to use them. In a few weeks, it is possible. Yes, but your soldiers must be able to master this because otherwise they will be cannon fodder. The Russians, I do not need to tell you this, go into this with an unbelievable amount of violence against Ukraine. And this conversation is largely symbolic for German politicians, but not just German, mind you, even amongst those who really do want to help Ukraine. But what about then training? What, what does that really look like in terms of time and effort? Well, this is complicated, but let's look at Gepard here. Gepard is not a plug and play device. That is absolutely obvious. It uses the chassis of the Leopard 1. And recently, for example, Jens Wehner, who is an ex-Leopard 1 driver, he noted on Twitter that it took him about six weeks to become a competent Leopard 1 driver. So that's a little bit of an estimate there that we can have. Of course, that time can be compressed with more intensive training, as well as that somebody who already has experience driving tanks or driving a heavy vehicle like a Gepard will probably be uh, be able to master it uh, quicker. However, again, there is a difference between being able to drive it and then being able to be combat capable in it, at which point you know, the skill level between those two, those two uh, categories is, uh, is quite different. And that, of course, it takes time. But I wouldn't even say that driving with the uh, Gepard is the main issue. Instead, of course, the sticking point with Gepard is the fire control system. How do you use it to identify, track, lock, and then engage targets? And how do you do this in a group or in a platoon of Gepards in combination or in, in collaboration, in cooperation with other assets on the ground and try in trying to establish some local air defense? And here, in theory, there are overlaps to Shilka or Tunguska, which would probably make it relatively easy sort of to conceptualize and uh, for Ukrainian soldiers that maybe have experience with those systems. But again, the system of actually using the weapons, sitting inside that turret and using the machine is very different. For example, there's recently there's actually a very knowledgeable ex-German Gepard commander who, uh, who indicated that the difficulties of operating a new system like that is more than we might assume. Weapon delivery, but now in reverse. We are in a conflict and we have no Gepards and the Ukraine is so nice to send us a Tunguska. I would be standing there like an ox in front of the mountain. I would not be able to operate the system. Nothing works without training. This then of course means that it's more about refurbishing and just sending the weapons, but offering real extensive training on them. And the manufacturer itself, perhaps ex Gepard operators or uh, other countries using Gepard could also assist in this measure. But that being said, we are not just talking about, of course, the actual weapon system, but we're also going to have to talk about sort of the stockpiles that could be put in place for spare parts, as well as the ammunition that is provided for these Gepards. And then, of course, a whole logistical chain has to be put into place, maybe even re reset and relaunched by industry in order to provide first Germany and NATO, and then of course Ukraine, with the capacities of actually fielding these Gepards. Before I talk about that in more detail, do consider, if you enjoy these videos, to check out my Patreon channel membership page, where you can support the channel. And not only that, you'll also get perks like 
early access to videos. In fact, there is one video that's already in early access now on the development of the F-15 and the F-16. It's a fascinating insight in some of the uh, political and institutional uh, dynamics that happened there during the uh, development of those really iconic aircraft. And I do recommend you watch that video when it comes out or of course in early access if you are a Patreon or channel member. But we also have a Discord channel where it's absolutely fantastic to hang out with all of you. We have bi-monthly meetings there as well to talk about anything and everything that has to do with military aviation. And recently we also uh, did an intelligence survey on Google Maps on zoos. That was quite uh, quite amusing, but <laughs> it, was, it was fun. Uh, we'll probably do that again, but this time with airfields. So as always, uh, if you do enjoy the content, do check out the support options with Patreon or channel memberships, if that is your jam. And now let's go back to the actual content. This of course begs the question of time schedules. In the beginning, much of the help provided by NATO countries to Ukraine was ready to use equipment, light weapons that did not require much training. Then followed more substantial deliveries of some heavier equipment that Ukraine already used. But as the war drags on, long-term support might require additional production of heavy weapons, extensive training and logistical support. One might say, well, even with long-term equipment, the sooner and the more you send, the better. But the timing does have to be right. In the short term, it is better to give Ukraine what it can already use. But at some point, if you want to send heavy weapons, there has to be a switch because, well, stockpiles are also going to be depleted from the stuff that you already sent. But that switch has to be prepared in advance. It cannot occur just willy-nilly. To illustrate this then, let us together now just have a thought experiment here. Remember that offer that the German industry gave to Ukraine, or rather the German government, of being able to pull 50 Gepards out of storage and send those to Ukraine after some refurbishments, right? Now, perhaps all of this is completely unfeasible, but let's just use it as an example for now. The Russian invasion started on the 24th of February 2022. The offer came on the 25th of February, and then Scholz's announcement to revamp the Bundeswehr came on the 27th. Assume that a Gepard delivery to Ukraine was agreed on, well, let's say the 28th, by now, seven weeks have passed, which could have been used to work on this. If the order came now, those seven weeks would be lost. However, say this decision was made, but in week five, it would have been clear that instead of 50 Gepards, only 15 can actually be made operational in a timely manner. This frees up many for additional spare parts. But then the question is, does this still make sense given the whole logistical and training chain that has to be created? The use of only 15 Gepards might also no longer be that pressing. After all, the Russian Air Force activity is limited and different to what it was assumed to be, and better options could have emerged by now. Yet during these five weeks, resources, time and manpower were pushed into a dead end. Equally, and this is part of the discussion, if a lot of projects are started and then the war ends, those resources might appear to have been wasted. Now, of course, that was just a thought experiment and you and I, we can, I think we can poke a lot of holes into it, but it was meant to illustrate some of the difficulties with sending systems like Gepard. You really need to appreciate the complexities as well as the necessities and also the applicabilities of these weapon systems now and in the future for Ukraine and uh, whether the investment really works in, in that sort of environment. And Remember, this is not just a question about one system. You have to do this about every single system that there is out there. And then you have to crystallize out of the selection points that you have the, 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 the best selection, really, and I hope that uh, everything works out in that way. So seeing this discussion in Germany, because of the reputation that Germany has, is, of course, one of those moments where, yes, the country is going to be criticized severely because of this lack of initiative. But remember, this is not just exclusive to Germany. A lot of NATO countries have very similar discussions as well. Of course, recently there have been changes. The first thing, of course, is sort of this rolling substitution that Germany is also taking part in with other NATO countries. So that is Eastern European countries sending weapons to Ukraine that Ukrainians can already use. And then countries like, for example, Britain or Germany sending their weapon systems to those Eastern European neighbors in order to substitute and fill that gap that has just been created. Because the timescales there for training and delivery 
deliveries are less pressing than they would be for Ukraine and it allows Ukraine to get stuff directly. And then of course um, the United States has continuously announced new major shipments as well but they of course have massive stockpiles and a well-funded army as well which means they can do that. And recently also Netherlands uh, appears to have been willing to help send uh, Panzerhaubitzen 2000 which are of course German systems to Ukraine. I believe the reason why they can actually send some is because they're only using half of the ones they have in their inventory. But if you're Dutch and if you know have more uh, accurate figures on that, please let me know. And of course, Germany has also said that they will be helping provide uh, tr providing training to Ukrainian operators on Panzerhaubitze as well, if this goes uh, to plan. And um, I also try to find out how long it actually takes to, uh, to train operators on Panzerhaubitze in order to get them combat capable. And apparently internally, in the Bundeswehr, the timeframes that are currently being discussed from what I found is a couple of weeks to all the way to two months. So there's a little bit of a, a spectrum there, a time spectrum that, uh, that uh, has to be kept in mind, of course. That said, and this is important, although Germany is providing a lot of humanitarian and financial help to Ukraine, as a main actor in Europe, the limited initiative that is shown by Germany and the fact that it is constantly reacting to things happening instead of being a proactive actor in this area really does not bode well, in my opinion, for its long-term reputation, especially amongst Eastern European countries, as well as you know, uh, its future influence in NATO as well. And yes, Germany is depleting Arsenal that is not news. I mean, this has been an issue for more than a decade now. And with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the scale of the sort of cut, uh, cost cutting uh, measures that have been put in place over the last decade or even longer than that, ever since the, the end of the Cold War, really, and the reunification of Germany, um, has been also pushed into the German public debate. Even on the day of the invasion, on the 24th of February 2022, there's a very interesting post here that was posted on uh, LinkedIn by Generalleutnant Alphonse Mais, who, well, what he said really made the rounds in the German media and public landscape. And the Bundeswehr, the Heer, that I am allowed to lead, stands more or less bare. The options that we can offer to politicians to support the alliance are extremely limited. Equally, in a recent press conference, Chancellor Scholz indicated something similar. Initially, we supplied Ukraine with weapons from our own stocks. In the meantime, we have to recognize that the options we have are reaching their limits. That's why we are setting up a special fund so that our armed forces will finally be well equipped after years of austerity. And we are investing massively in the capabilities of the Bundeswehr. This will not happen overnight. While this is not exactly news for those who have worked on the issue, the initial statement by General Lieutenant Mais caught immediate media attention. There was overall surprise by the bad state of the Bundeswehr. Yet the signs had been there. For example, in 2016, a poll indicated that just under 60% of German soldiers had mixed feelings or even limited to no confidence in their equipment. But a poll asking civilians just a few months prior to this what they thought about the Bundeswehr's equipment, 60% answered that they considered it to be good to very good. Keep in mind that this followed multiple headline stories about helicopters that didn't fly, the G36 debate, discussions about armed drones, and so on. There thus seems to have been, at least back then, a real disconnect between what Germans thought the Bundeswehr had and reality, and that's been going on for some time. As Professor Sönke Neitzel noted in 2020, Bundeswehr still does not have enough ammunition to fight a highly armed opponent. It is barely capable of night combat, has too little artillery and no functioning army air defense. It is still too inefficient in arms procurement and too ineffective and weak in responsibility in its entire structure, particularly in the ministry. Thus nothing has changed in the Federal Republic's structural pacifism in recent years. Although the goals set out in 2018 was to make the Bundeswehr a fully-fledged army again by 2031, as it is called in bureaucrat German, the political will to implement this is not really evident. 
The target is primarily to be understood as a political concession to NATO, similar to the agreement to aim for 2% of GDP for defense spending. I could say many things about how the Bundeswehr is perceived in German society, past and present, but that's not really the scope of this video. What I will say is this, however, for a long time, many in Germany showed absolutely no interest, even a negative interest, really, in, uh, in discussing the Bundeswehr. And that this interest, never mind the reason for it, yeah, created, in my opinion, a blind spot. Right? A blind spot in which we, I think, can find some of the reasons of why there is such mismanagement, such wastage, such inefficient bureaucracy, and also such poor political decision-making. Because, I mean, at least in my view, in my, I would argue that even a pacifist should be interested in his country's or her country's armed forces. Because, and engage with them as well. You have to think about it, to talk about it, to inform themselves about it, in order to understand, first of all, what the subject area is, what this armed force can and cannot do, what it is there for, but then also that there is some sort of measure of public control of what is going on with the armed forces, that there is some sort of public oversight on where funds are being allocated and what the armed forces are being used for. And yes, of course, that means that some people are going to have to engage with a subject area that they find deeply uncomfortable. And let's be honest, military subjects, they're not light. I mean, the implication of these weapon systems are drastic, to put it mildly. And that also requires them sometimes to question their own world views. Currently, opinion polls indicate that there is support for increased spending on the Bundeswehr. In the beginning of March 2022, 65% of Germans agreed with the 100 billion euro special fund package for the Bundeswehr, and 61% agreed that Ukraine should get weapons from Germany. Only a month before the war, the support to give more money to the Bundeswehr had only stood at 44%. So, I hope that you got something from this video, and if you did, well, first of all, consider supporting the channel via Patreon and channel memberships, but more significantly also, tell me what you thought about all of this. Go to the comment section below and let me know, what do you think about the German governmental position on Ukraine? Do you think Germany should be doing more? Do you think that Germany is doing just enough? Or do you think that Germany has done too much? Although I don't think many people will go with that option. Also, let me know, in your own countries, are there similar discussions happening? What are your own countries doing to help Ukraine? Of course, if you're in the US, you can just lean back and say and show the whole inventory that has already been sent uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. But uh, yeah, it would be nice to sort of see, uh, uh, see uh, if you uh, have similar discussion in all of your countries. So at this point, thank you very much for watching. Also, big thank you here to Bernard Kast from Military History Visualized for a providing uh, footage for this video, specifically there, of course, footage also filmed at the Deutsche Panzermuseum. Big thank you also here to the Deutsche Panzermuseum and Michael Musman for driving the Gepard. And also thank you to Werner Kast once again also for his input on the script. So as always, have a good day and see you in the sky.